So we passed a three-story motel. Every room was lighted, every window filled with people staring out at us. There were a parade of fools. We were a parade of fools, open not only to the effects of chemical fallout, but to the scornful judgment of other people. Why weren't they out there? Sitting in heavy coats behind windshield wipers in the silent snow, it seemed imperative that we get to the Boy Boy Scout camp. Scramble into the main building, seal the doors, huddle on camp beds with our juice and coffee, wait for the all clear. Cars began to mount the grassy incline at the edge of the road, creating a third lane of severely tilted traffic. Situated in what formerly been the right-hand lane, we didn't have any choice but to watch these cars pass us at slightly higher elevation and with a rakish thrust deviated from the horizontal. Slowly we approached the overpass, seeing people on foot up there. They carry boxes and suitcases, objects and blankets, a long line of people leaning in the blowing snow. People cradling pets and small children. <clears throat> An old man wearing a blanket over his pajamas. Two, wo- two women shouldering a rolled up rug. There were people on bicycles, children being pulled on sleds and in wagons. People with supermarket carts, people clad in every kind of bulky outfit, peering out from the deep hoods. There was a family wrapped completely in plastic, a single large sheet of transparent polyethylene. (laughs) They were beneath their shield in lockstep. Uh, The man and woman, each at one end, their kids between, all of them secondary, wrapped in shimmering rainwear. The whole affair had about it a well-rehearsed and well-satisfied look, as though they'd been waiting for months to strut their stuff. People kept appearing from behind a high rampart and trudging across the overpass, shoulders dusted with snow, hundreds of people moving with a kind of faded determination. A new round of sirens started up. The trudging people did not quicken their pace, did not look down at us or onto the night sky with some sign of wind-driven cloud. They just kept moving across the bridge through patches of snow, raging lights. Out in the open, keeping their children near, carrying what they could, they seemed to be part of some ancient density, connected in doom and ruin to a whole history of people trekking across wasted landscapes. There was an epic quality about them that made me wonder for the first time at the scope of their predicament. The radio said it was the rainbow hologram that gives this credit card a marketing intrigue. We moved slowly beneath the overpass, hearing a flurry of automobile horns and imploring wail of an ambulance stuck in traffic. Fifty yards ahead, the traffic narrowed to one lane, and we soon saw why. One of the cars had skidded off the incline and barreled into a vehicle in our lane. Horns quacked up and down the line. A helicopter sat just above us, shining a white beam down on the mass collapsed metal. People sat dazed on the grass, being tended to by a pair of bearded paramedics. Two people were bloody. There was a blood there was blood on a smashed window, blood soaked upward through newly fallen snow. Drops of blood speckled a tan handbag. A scene of injured people, medics, smoking steel, all washed in a strong and eerie light, took on the eloquence of a formal composition. We passed silently by, feeling curiously reverent, even uplifted by the sight of the heaped cars and fallen people. Heinrich kept watching through the rear window taking up his binoculars as the scene dwindled in the distance. He described for us in detail the number of emplacement of bodies, the skid marks, the vehicular damage. When the wreck was no longer visible, we talked about everything that had happened since the air raid siren at dinner. He spoke enthusiastically with a sense of appreciation for the vivid and unexpected. He thought we all occupied the same mental state, subdued, worried, confused. It hadn't occurred to me that one of us might find these events brilliantly stimulating. I looked at him in the rearview mirror. He sat slouched in the camouflage jacket in Velcro closures, with Velcro closures, steeped happily in disaster. He talked about the snow, the traffic, the trudging people. 
He speculated on how far we were from the abandoned camp, what sort of primitive accommodations might be available there. I never heard him go on about something with such spirited enjoyment. He was practically giddy. He must have known we could all die. Was this some kind of end of the world elation? Did he seek distraction from his own miseries in some violent and overwhelming event? His voice betrayed a craving for terrible things. In this, in this, is this a mild winter or a harsh winter? Steffi said. Compared to what? Denise said. I don't know. I thought I saw Babette slip something into her mouth. I took my eye off the road for a moment, watched her carefully. She looked straight ahead. I pretended to return my attention to the road, but quickly turned once more. Catching her off guard as she seemed to swallow whatever it was she put in her mouth. What was that? I said. Drive the car, Jack. I saw your throat contract. You swallow something. Just a lifesaver. Drive the car, please. You placed a lifesaver in your mouth and swallowed it without an interval of sucking? Swallow what? It's still in my mouth. She thrust her face forward, using her tongue to make a small lump in her cheek. A clear-cut, amateurish bluff. But you swallow something, I saw. That was just saliva that I didn't know that I didn't know what to do with. Drive the car, would you? It seemed I sensed that Denise was getting interested and decided not to pursue the matter. This was not the time to be questioning her mother about medication, side effects, and so on. Wilder was asleep leaning into Babette's arms. The windshield wipers made sweaty arcs. From the radio, we learned the dogs trained to sniff out niodine D were being sent to the area from a chemical detection center in a remote part of New Mexico. Denise said, did they ever think about what happened to the dogs when they get close enough to this stuff to smell it? Nothing happens to the dogs, Babette said. How do you know? Because it only affects humans and rats. I don't believe you. Ask Jack. Ask Heinrich, I said. It could be true, he said, clearly lying. <laughs> uh, they use rats to test for things that humans can catch, so it means we get the same diseases, rats and humans. Besides, they wouldn't use dogs if they thought it could hurt them. Why not? A dog is a mammal. So is a rat, Denise said. A rat is a vermin, Babette said. Mostly what a rat is, Heinrich said, it's, is a rodent. It's also a vermin. A cockroach is a vermin, Steffi said. A cockroach is an insect. You can count the legs is how you know. It's, all, it's also a vermin. Does a cockroach get cancer? No, Denise said. That must mean a rat is more like a human than it is like a cockroach, even if they're both vermin. It says a rat and a human can get cancer, but a cockroach can't. In other words, Heinrich said, she's saying that two things that are mammals have more in common than two things that are only vermins. Are you people telling me, Babette said, that a rat is not only a vermin and a rodent, but a mammal too? Snow turned to sleet, sleet to rain. We reached the point where the concrete barriers gave way to a 20-yard stretch of landscape median no higher than the curbstone. But instead of a state trooper directing traffic into extra lanes, we saw a Milex suited man waving us away from the opening. Just beyond him was the scrap metal burial mound of a Winnebago and a snowplow. The huge and tortured wreck emitted a wisp of rusty smoke. Brightly colored plastic utensils were scattered for her some distance. There was no sign of victims or fresh blood, leading us to believe that some time had passed since the recreational vehicle mounted the plow, probably in a moment when opportunism seemed an easily defensible failing given the situation. It must have been the blinding snow that caused the driver to leap the median without, nothing, without noting an object on the other side. I saw all this before, Steffi said. What do you mean, I said. This happened once before, just like this. The man in the yellow suit and gas mask. The big wreck sitting in the snow. It was totally and exactly like this. We were all here in the car. Rain made the holes in, rain made holes in the snow. Everything. It was Heinrich who told me that 
exposure to the chemical waste could cause a person to experience a sense of deja vu. Stephanie wasn't there when he said it, but she could have heard it on the kitchen radio, where she and Denise had probably learned about sweaty palms and vomiting before developing these symptoms, these symptoms themselves. I didn't think Steffi knew what deja vu meant, but it was possible Babette had told her. Deja vu, however, was no longer a working symptom of niodine contamination. It had been preempted by coma, convulsions, and miscarriage. If Steffi had learned about deja vu on the radio, but then missed the subsequent upgrading to more deadly conditions, it can mean she was in a position to be tricked by her own apparatus of suggestibility. She and Denise had been lagging all evening. They were late with sweaty palms, late with nausea, late again with deja vu. What did it all mean? Did Steffi truly imagine she'd seen the wreck before? Or did she only imagine she imagined it? Is it possible to have a false perception of an illusion? Is there a deja vu and a false deja vu? I wonder whether her palms have been truly sweaty or whether she simply imagined a sense of wetness. And was she so open to suggestion that she would develop every symptom as it was announced? I feel sad for people and and the queer part we play in our own disasters. But if she hadn't heard the radio, didn't know what deja vu was, was it? What if she was developing real symptoms by natural means? Maybe the scientists were right in the first place with their original announcements before they revised upwards. Which was worse, the real condition or the self-created one? And did it matter? I wondered about these and and allied questions. As I drove, I found myself giving a taking an oral examination based on the kind of quibbling fine points that had entertained several centuries worth of medieval idlers. Could I? Could a nine-year-old girl suffer a miscarriage due to the power of suggestion? Would she have to be pregnant first? Could the power of suggestion be strong enough to work backwards in this manner from miscarriage to pregnancy to menstruation to ovulation? Which comes first, menstruation or ovulation? Are we talking about mere symptoms or deeply entrenched conditions? Is a symptom a sign or a thing? What is a thing and how do we know is not another thing? I turned off the radio, not to help help me think, but to keep me from thinking. Vehicles lurched and skidded. Someone threw a gun gum wrapper out of a side window, and Babette made an indignant speech about inconsiderate people littering the highways and countryside. Mind you, all these people are in a disaster, and <laughs> she's just commenting on his random sh- stuff. I'll tell you something else that's happened before, Heinrich said. We're running out of gas. The dial quivered on E. There's always extra, Babette said. How can there always be extra? That's the way the tank is constructed so you don't run out. There can't always be extra if you keep going. You run out. You don't keep going forever. How do you know when to stop, he said. When you pass a gas station, I told him. And there it was, a deserted rain-swept plaza with proud pumps standing beneath an array of multicolored banners. I I drove in, jumped out of the car, ran around to the pumps with my head tucked under the raised collar of my coat. They were not locked, which meant the attendants had fled suddenly, leaving things intriguingly as they were, like the tools and pottery of some Pueblo civilization, bread in the oven, table set for three, a mystery of haunt, a mystery to haunt the generations. I seized the hose of the unleaded pump. The banner smacked in the wind. A few minutes later, back on the road, we saw a remarkable and startling sight. It appeared in the sky ahead of us and to the left, prompting us to lower ourselves into our seats, bend our heads for a clearer view, exclaim to each other in half-finished phrases. It was the black billowing cloud, the airborne toxic event, lighted by the clear beams of seven army helicopters. They were tracking its windborne movements, keeping it in view. 
In every car, heads shifted. Drivers blew their horns to alert others. Faces appeared inside windows, expressions set in tones in outlandish wonderment. The enormous dark mask, excuse me, the en- enormous dark mass moved like some depths ships in a Norse legend, escorted across the night by armored creatures with spiraled wings. We weren't sure how to react. It was a terrible thing to see, so close, so low, packed with chlorhydes, benzenes, phenols, hydrocarbons, or whatever the present toxic content, the precise toxic content. But it was also spectacular, part of the grandness of a sweeping event, like the vivid scene in the switching yard or the people trudging across the snowy overpass with children, food, belongings, a tragic army of the dispossessed. Our fear was accompanied by a sense of awe that bordered on the religious. It is surely possible to be awed by things that threaten your life, to see it as a cosmic force so much larger than yourself more powerful, created by elemental and willful rhythms. There was a death made in the laboratory, defined, measurable, but we thought of it at the time in a simple and primitive way, as some seasonal perversity of the earth, like a flood or tornado, something not subject to control. Our helplessness did not seem compatible with the idea of a man-made event. In the back seat, the kids fought for possession of the binoculars. The whole thing was amazing. They seemed to be spotlighting the cloud for us as if it were a part of a sound and light show. A bit of mood setting mist drifting across a high battlement where a king had been slain. But this was not history we were witnessing. It was some secret festering thing, some dreamed emotion that accompanies the dreamer out of sleep. Flares came swooning from the helicopters, creaming bursts of red and white light. Drivers sounded their horns, and children crowded all the windows, faces tilted, pink hands pressed against the glass. The road curved away from the toxic cloud, and traffic moved more freely for a while. At an intersection near the Boy Scout camp, two school buses entered the main mainstream traffic, both carrying the insane of blacksmith. We recognized the drivers, spotted familiar faces in the window, people we customarily saw sitting on lawn chairs behind the asylum sparse hedges or walking into ever-narrowing circles with ever-increasing speed, like spinning masses in a gyration device. We felt an odd affection for them, and a sense of relief that they were being looked after in a diligent and professional manner. It seemed to me it seemed to mean the structure was intact. We passed a sign for the most photographed barn in America. It took an hour to funnel traffic into a single lane approach to the camp. Milex suited men waved flashlights and set out day glow pylons directing us toward the parking lot and onto athletic fields and other areas. People came out of the woods, some wearing headlamps, some carrying shopping bags, children, pets. We were bumped along dirt paths. Our ruts and mounds near the main building, we saw a group of men and women carrying clipboards and walkie-talkies, non milex suit, uh, suited officials, experts in the new science of evacuation. Steffi joined Wilder in a fitful sleep. The rain let up. People turned off their headlights, sat uncertainly in their cars. The long, strange journey was over. We waited for a sense of satisfaction to reach us, some mood in the air of quiet accomplishment, the well-earned fatigue that promises a still and deep-lying sleep. People sat in the dark cars, staring out at each other through closed windows. Heinrich ate a candy bar. We listened to the sound of his teeth getting stuck in the caramel and glucose mass. Finally, a family of five got out of a Datsun Maxima. They wore life jackets and carried flares. Small crowds collected around certain men. Here were the sources of information and rumor. One person worked in a chemical plant. Another had overheard a remark. A third was related to a clerk in a state agency. True, false, and other kinds of news radiated through the dormitory from these dense clusters. 
It was said that we would be allowed to go home first thing in the morning. The government was engaged in a cover-up that a helicopter had entered the toxic cloud and never reappeared, that the dogs had arrived from New Mexico, parachuting into a meadow in a daring night drop, that the town of Farmington would be uninhabitable for 40 years. Remarks existed in a state permanent flotation, in a state of permanent flotation. No one thing was either more or less plausible than any other thing. As people jolted out of reality, we were releasing from the need to distinguish. Some families chose to sleep in their cars. Others were forced to do so because there was no room for them in the seven or eight buildings on the ground. We were in a large barracks, one of three such buildings at the camp. With the generator now working, we were fairly comfortable. The Red Cross had finally provided cots, portable heaters, sandwiches, and coffee. There were kerosene lamps to supplement the existing overhead lights. Many people had radios, extra food to share with others, blankets, beast chairs, extra clothing. The place was crowded, still quite cold, but the sight of nurses and volunteer workers made us feel the children were safe, and the presence of other stranded souls, young women with infants, old and infirm people, gave us a certain staunchness and will, a selflessness bent that was pronounced enough to function as a common identity. The large gray area, dank and bare, and lost to history just a couple hours ago, made an oddly agreeable place right now, filled with an eagerness of community and voice. Seekers of news move from one cluster of people to another, tending to linger at the larger groups. In this way, I moved slowly through the barracks. There were nine evacuation centers, I learned, including this one and the Kung Fu Palace. Arn City had not been emptied out, nor had most of the other towns in the area. It was said that the governor was on his way from the capital in an executive helicopter. It would probably set down in a bean field outside of a deserted town, allowing the governor to emerge square-jawed and confident in a bush jacket with camera range for 10 or 15 seconds as a demonstration of his imperishability. What a surprise it was to ease my way between people at the outer edge of the largest cluster and discover that my own son was at the center of things, speaking in his newfound voice, his tone of enthusiasm for runaway calamity. He was talking about the airborne toxic event in a technical way, although his voice all but sang with prophetic disclosure. He pronounced the name itself, Niodine Derivative, with an unseemly relish, making morbid delight in, a very, in the very sound. People listen attentively to the adolescent boy in a filled jacket and cap with binoculars strapped around his neck and in instamatic fast, fastened to his belt. No doubt the, his listeners were influenced by his age. He would be truthful and earnest, serving no special interest. He would have an awareness of the environment. His knowledge of chemistry would be fresh and up-to-date. I heard him say, the stuff they sprayed on the big spill at the train yard was probably soda ash, but it was a case of too little too late. My guess is they'll get some crop dusters up in the air at daybreak and bombard the toxic cloud with lots more soda ash, which could break it up and scatter it into a million harmless puffs. Soda ash is the common name for sodium carbonate, which is used in the manufacture of glass, ceramics, detergents, and soaps. It's also what they use to make bicarbonate of soda, something a lot of you probably guzzled after a night on the town. People moved in closer, impressed by the boy's knowledgeability and wit. It was remarkable to hear him speak so easily to a crowd of strangers. He was finding himself, learning how to determine his worth from the reactions of others. It was possible that out of the turmoil and surge of this dreadful event, he will learn to make his way in the world. What you're probably all wondering is exactly is this Niodine D? 
we keep hearing about a good question. We studied it in school. We saw movies of rats having convulsions and so on. So, okay, it's basically simple. Niodine D is a whole bunch of things thrown together that are byproducts of the manufacture of insecticide. The original stuff kills roaches. The byproducts kill everything left over. A little joke our teacher made. He snapped his finger, let his left leg swing a bit. In the powder form, it's colorless, odorless, and very dangerous, except no one seems to know exactly what it is, what it causes in humans or in the offsprings of humans. They tested for years, and either they don't know for sure, or they know and they aren't saying. Some things are too awful to publicize. He arched his brows and began to twitch comically, his tongue lolling in a corner of his mouth. I was astonished to hear people laugh. Once it, seeps, once it seeps into the soil, it has a lifespan of 40 years. This is longer than a lot of people. After five years, you'll notice various kinds of fungi appearing between your regular windows and storm windows, as well as in your clothes and food. After 10 years, your screens will turn rusty and begin to pit and rot. Siding will warp. There will be glass breakage and trauma to pets. After 20 years, you'll probably have to seal yourself in the attic and just wait and see. I guess there's a lesson in all this. Get to know your chemicals. I didn't want him to see me there. It would make him self-conscious, remind him of his former life as a gloomy and fugitive boy. Let him bloom, if that's what he's doing. In the name of mischance, dread, and random disaster. So I slipped away, passing a man who wore snow boots wrapped in plastic and headed for the far end of the barracks where we'd made camp earlier. We were next to a black family of Jehovah's Witnesses. A man and a woman and a boy about 12. Father and son were handing out tracts to people nearby and seemed, have no, and seemed to have no trouble finding willing recipients and listeners. The woman said to Babette, Isn't this something? Nothing surprises me anymore, Babette said. Isn't that the truth? What would surprise me would be if there was no surprises. Were no surprises. That sounds about right. Or if there were... Little bitty surprises. That would be a surprise instead of things like this. God Jehovah's got a bigger surprise in store than this, the woman said. God Jehovah, that's the one. Steffi and Wilder were asleep in one of the cots. Denise sat at the other end engrossed in the physician's desk reference. Several air mattresses were stacked against the wall. There was a long line at the empty at the emergency telephone. People calling relatives or trying to reach the switchboard at one or another radio call-in show. The radios were turned mainly to such shows. Uh, Babette sat in a camp chair, going through a canvas bag full of snack tins and other provisions. I noticed jars and cartons that had been sitting in the refrigerator and cabinet for months. I thought this would be a good time to cut down on fatty things, she said. Why now especially? This is a time for discipline, mental toughness. We're practically on the edge, at the edge. I think it's interesting you regard a possible disaster for yourself, your family, and thousands of others as an opportunity to cut down on fatty foods. You take discipline where you find it, she said. If I don't eat my yogurt now, I may as well stop buying the stuff forever, except I think I'll skip the wheat germ. The... Brand name was foreign looking. I picked up the jar of wheat germ and examined the label closely. It's German, I told her. Eat it. There were people in pajamas and slippers, a man with a rifle slung over his shoulder, kids crawling into sleeping bags. Babette gestured, wanting me to lean closer. Let's keep the radio turned off, she said. So the girls can't hear. They haven't gotten beyond deja vu. I want to keep this away. What if the symptoms are real? How could they be real? Why couldn't they be real? Let them only... They... I'm sorry. They get them only when they're broadcasted, she whispered. Did Steffi hear about deja vu on the radio? She must have. How do you know? 
were you with her when it was broadcast? I'm not sure. Think hard. I can't remember.